Thanks everyone for being here. Um, I want to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about salvage therapies for localized prostate cancer. I'll credit Dr. Kundu with the with the uh, with the title. He calls it Plan B. You know, so when Plan A, a may uh, not be succeeding, what do we do from there? The objectives is we're going to start out with a contrasting case review, and then we're going to talk about um, how we identify recurrences after initial local therapies, um, both the disease localization and then a prognostic assessment. And then we'll talk about salvage treatments of presumed recurrences, both after prostatectomy and also after radiation therapies. Uh, I'm, by the way, Ashley Ross. I'm a, an associate professor of urology here at the Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine. So let's go to, a, to two cases that I've, uh, patients I've treated over the last uh, several months. The first was a, a, an 80 year old who presented to me with radio recurrent prostate cancer. At age 73, he was diagnosed with stage one disease, and he was a uh, NCCN low risk uh, prostate cancer with four out of 12 cores positive all on the right. PSA was 3.4. And he liked it to have brachytherapy. His PSA would nadir um, at 0.9 about two years after that, and then it started to consistently rise. Um, he was seen um, by one of our medical oncologists, and it was noted that his PSA was rising to 2.5. And with the three consecutive rises, he thought we should try to restage him. An MRI, um, which is depicted here on the right, um, showed a 29 um, cc prostate. In the right, per right peripheral zone, there was a lesion. Um, it's shown there in the 3D reconstruction of the upper of the upper left uh, panel. A lesion here in the right peripheral zone, away from the urethra, also shown here. The CT and bone scan were negative for metastases. He was then referred to me, and we did a, pro a prostate biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. Um, we did system system uh, systematic sampling of the prostate, including the seminal vesicles, and including the target lesions that showed up on the MRI. This showed a Gleason grade group 5 cancer in that target lesion. Uh, the right seminal vesicle had brachytherapy changes, but was negative for carcinoma. So then we had a discussion. Um, we discussed uh, first what his life expectancy was. By the Social Security actuarial tables, he had an 8.43 year life expectancy. He was in a, the top quartile of his health. And so um, there's a rough behind the envelope calculation where you can take individuals like that and add 25% to their life expectancy. And that would give him about a 10 year life expectancy. We, th we then said, well, maybe he would benefit from local therapy, um, potentially curative local therapy. His disease was greater than 0.5 centimeters from urethra based on both imaging and on my biopsy findings, and his seminal vesicles weren't involved um, based on my biopsy findings. So he was a candidate for salvage cryoablation, and we performed that as an outpatient. He tolerated that well. Um, at three months, his PSA is 0.3 nanograms per mil, and he's continent. Let's contrast this with another case. This is a younger gentleman, 62 years old. Um, when this gentleman was 49 years of age, he was diagnosed with low-risk prostate cancer, and he elected to have brachytherapy. His PSA would nadir and then start to rise, um, and this was about eight years after the initial brachytherapy, and he would have restaging. Uh, that would show no metastatic disease, but in the prostate, uh, he had Gleason grade group two cancer and Gleason grade group one cancer. He then had a discussion with his radiation oncologist who treated him the first time, and they elected to undergo salvage brachytherapy after initial brachytherapy. His PSA continued to rise uh, after that, and um, he had negative staging for distant metastatic disease. They did not re-biopsy the prostate, but he was started on Casodex with the idea that then he would start hormonal therapy and maybe do intermittent androgen deprivation. Very quickly after starting Casodex, um, he had severe depression and hopelessness. Um, they continued the Casodex uh, to see if that would persist, and it did. And they stopped the case at two months, and they decided not to initiate uh, androgen deprivation therapy. He did have a, a good PSA response to those, just those two months of case with his PSA dropping to about 1.09, but four months later had risen back to about 9.2. He had an oximin PET in uh, October, which showed no signs of prostate cancer. But his PSA continued to rise to 13. He saw one of the medical oncologists in our system, and they thought, let's do another oximin PET. This time it showed a possible recurrence in the prostate, um, no other distant disease. Uh, an MRI was also performed that showed a possible um, lesion in, in the prostate as well, and he was sent to me uh, for a biopsy to confirm the disease. 
Biopsy of his prostate showed uh, high-grade prostate cancer in virtually every core, um, including both seminal vesicles and including cores that were nearer to the urethra. So we talked about his case together. He had a life expectancy of about 20 years. He's 62 years old at this time. Um, his disease was less than five millimeters from the urethra and his seminal vesicles were involved, making ablative therapies difficult to elicit a cure. I told him he was not a cryovolution candidate for sure, uh, given those findings, um, and we decided to go undergo a salvage radical prostatectomy. He had an uneventful perioperative course. Uh, he was discharged from the hospital within 24 hours. After salvage um, prostatectomies, I leave the catheter in for three weeks, and I do cystogram on everybody. This is his cystogram uh, shown there on the right. Um, you can see that there's no leak. You can also see that there's a, a plethora of brachytherapy seeds that were just placed in the um, external sphincter and pelvic floor muscles. Um, and then after that, uh, he's done pretty well. At one month after catheter removal, he's regaining his continence, so actually a little bit better than I expected. He's down to about one to two pads per day. His pathology showed T3B disease, uh, no lymph node involvement. He had a positive surgical margin, uh, both in the, at the seminal vesicle um, and at the left base. Um, he had cancer throughout his prostate and, and EPE uh, throughout with, with bilateral SVs involved. Um, we're still waiting for his first PSA. So that kind of brings us into the discussion tonight, which is gonna be a discussion of uh, recurrences after local therapy for, for prostate cancer. So recurrences after initial local therapy for prostate cancer, so when you're treating um, what you believe is localized disease to cure, actually are fairly common. Um, in the literature, it's 20 to 50% undergoing radical prostatectomy or, or definitive quote unquote radiation um, at 10 years. Those point estimates are actually probably conservative given the current clinical landscape. Probably we're close to 50%, maybe more of the patients um, will need more therapy um, beyond their first modality of treatment with longer follow-up. And this is because we're following uh, patients with low-risk prostate cancer on surveillance, and the bulk of the patients that we're treating with prostate cancer are really closer to unfavorable intermediate risk or higher risk disease. So knowing that it's a that this is an inevitable issue that's going to affect many of our patients undergoing treatment for their prostate cancer you know how do we define uh, recurrence how do we define that our first uh, therapeutic approach may have failed well um, let's look at that both after prostatectomy and also um, after radiation after prostatectomy the AUA threshold for biochemical recurrence which still uh, biochemical recurrence is going to be our first indicator of disease recurrence is a PSA of um, 0 0.2 that's confirmed. Now, my belief is that we should, that we're in a different era now, that ultra-sensitive PSAs are reliable and should be used. Although, you know, there's still a lot to figure out there around ultra-sensitive PSAs. And one thing to figure out is that there is some noise at the ultra-sensitive level and where can we really be confident uh, in the ultra-sensitive PSAs. Um, I think the threshold that was proposed by SoCal and colleagues a few years ago of 0.03 um, seems to have very good um, performance characteristics. So this is just uh, some data from that paper. If we look at people who had their first PSA uh, ultra-sensitive being less than 0.03, their five-year biochemical-free survival is about 91%, whereas people with PSAs greater than 0.03, their five-year biochemical-free survival is about 27%. So what I typically do is I use ultrasensitive PSAs routinely in the post-prostatectomy setting. I will use them until the PSA gets to, to 0.1, and then I can convert over to regular PSAs if I want. But I think there's a high value of ultrasensitive PSAs. So how about following biochem how about biochemical recurrence following radiation? I think that the you know, Phoenix definition that was revised by Astro and the RTOG makes a lot of sense and is very useful. It's a Nader plus two definition. Um, or consecutive rises um, uh, in the PSA, so three above the nadir. Importantly, the nadir plus two definition is regardless of use of ADT or not. So if you used ADT and the person's nadir was undetectable, then your nadir plus two de definition means PSA of two, you should be suspecting a recurrence. It's also important to note that the Phoenix definition was designed to make comparisons between retrospective series, and it's really designed to identify meaningful recurrences that would often lead to metastatic events. And so, you know, you can use a lot of your clinical expertise. Your, your antenna can be up with, with patients that you might suspect. And certainly, I think adding to the Nader 2 plus 2 definition by consecutive rises makes a lot of sense. We saw that in our first patient scenario that I presented. 
So just some additional considerations when we're thinking about biochemical recurrence following radiation. Um, in brachytherapy patients, um, at five years, the PSA really should be less than 0.7 to be confident that uh, uh, a cure has been elicited. Another point, although it's seldom used outside of the context of clinical trials, a biopsy at two years following external beam radiation, um, even regardless of what the PSA is doing, can be very predictive of recurrences. Uh, but again, this isn't used that standardly in clinical care. So what is the workup, and now with that in mind, what is the workup and treatment of someone with potentially recurrent or persistent prostate cancer after an initial attempt for cure um, by local management, whether it be surgery or radiation? So at the, this is like one of the most important things of the talk. I'm going to have a couple slides on it because I want to emphasize this point greatly um, because I, I, I often will see patients where um, this hasn't really been the case. So early evaluation and management decisions is, is paramount and allows for potential cure. And I don't really mean early in terms of temporal time as much as like early in terms of like disease burden or PSA levels. So the PSA at the time of salvage is highly, if not the most prognostic factor for long-term remission. It's true with salvage radiation therapy following radical prostatectomy. It's true with salvage prostatectomy following radiation. It's true with salvage cryoablation following radiation. It's true for salvage high food following radiation. So we want to monitor our people in their survivorship carefully. We want to consider salvage treatments early and not wait until the disease is incurable. As a rule of thumb, if it helps you remember, you want to be in initiating a salvage therapy if you're going to do so after radical prostatectomy at PSAs less than or equal to 0.4. And at, for salvage prostatect, for sal uh, and after radiation therapy, you want to be initiating salvage therapies at PSAs less than or equal to 4. Then you're after those thresholds, you're really losing opportunities for cure. So let's go through some of that data just to drive this home. You've done a prostatectomy on a gentleman. You know, you know that because you're, you're, you're surveying your low risk guys and you're really taking intermediate and high risk men to surgery, that there's a high chance of recurrence. And so you're monitoring them carefully. And what you want to do is make sure you're referring them to radiation therapy if needed when the PSA is not too high. This is a large series of men treated with, with radical prostatectomy. And it's stratifying them by what were their outcomes based on what their PSA was before they got their salvage radiation. In the uh, darker blue line is salvage radiation given before the PSA was 0.2, yellow 0.2 to 0.5, and then the other lines below. And the best outcomes are seen with the lower PSAs, both in terms of freedom from biochemical free uh, recurrences and also in cumulative incidence of metastatic disease shown on the right-hand plot. You can see that if, if the PSA is less than um, 0.5 at the time of salvage radiation therapy, they're, they're going to have significantly less uh, incidence of distant metastatic disease. Um, same thing for the biochemical free survival. The same holds true in your post-radiation patients. You've treated the patient with external beam radiation or brachytherapy and you're monitoring them. Take the astro guidelines seriously. Follow those patients. When they get to a nadir plus two or consecutive rises, they really deserve a workup and an opportunity for cure of their disease. Um, this is a smaller series of, of people undergoing salvage radical prostatectomy after radiation. And you can see the top line is men treated when their PSA was less than four at the time of salvage prostatectomy. They're doing astronomically better in terms of disease progression free survival compared to people who have PSAs between four to 10, and certainly from patient, patients with PSA greater than 10 that are rarely cured by salvage therapies. Same thing holds with salvage cryoablation after radiation failures shown on the left and salvage HIFU um, shown on the right. Your five-year freedom from uh, your five-year freedom from recurrence is about 60% um, when you have um, PSAs less than four for and you do salvage ablative therapies after radiation, and it's like 14 to 22% if the PSA is greater than 10. So monitor your guys carefully, give them this this opportunity for cure. Don't let their don't let their disease progress to an incurable state. And again, you know. Why, you know, what, what are we talking about here? It seems so obvious, but so many times do I see patients come to my clinic, like the second patient that we just talked about when he first came to see me, his PSA was over, over 10, or even when he was first worked up for his first salvage, his PSA was over 10 in that young man. You know, it's, it, it's almost nonsensical to me. Um, and the, what we're talking about is the likelihood of metastatic disease increases with PSA. 
Um, here you have PET PSMA on the left and fluciclovine scans on the right. And what you can see, this is in post-surgical patients, but I think it um, you know, rings true in the post-radiation setting as well. You can see that as the PSA level increases, so does the, the chance that you're going to have um, uh, you know, multiple regions, including extra pelvic regions involved by disease. In fact, as we go from, um, as we go from uh, PSAs of under 0.5 to PSAs of 0.5 to less than one, you see more than a doubling of the chance that you're going to have extra pelvic disease, either with um, PSMA on the left or with oxygen on the right. And you know, I think that rationale that like, oh, if they have a recurrence, they're, it's inevitably you know, metastatic, we can't have the second opportunity for cure, which I think a lot of us don't hold, and it's good that we don't hold it because it's not true, particularly for disease that we are diagnosing um, that appear to be localized clinically that we're taking for definitive managements, when those diseases evolve, they dissolve, evolve from local to local, regional to metastatic in almost all the cases. And so there is a window of opportunity for cure. That window of opportunity is at lower PSAs, and we need to institute the appropriate workup at those lower PSAs. So now here's what is the workup and treatment. We'll start with post-prostatectomy, where it's a little bit easier, and then we'll look at post-radiation. Um, How are we monitoring, guys? How are we doing the workup? Some notes of consideration post-prostatectomy. Restaging, even with PET PSMA, is not very informative at PSAs less than 0.2. Remember that the PET can't really see um, lesions that are less than three millimeter. You're often going to have a negative scan with the PSA is less than 0.2. A second thing to note is that PSA doubling time is not really well validated or validated at all at the ultra-sensitive PSA um, level. Uh, and so we, we, we really can't benefit from watching a doubling time. And if we're watching a doubling time as they go from 0.2 to 0.4 or 0.4 and on, as I just showed, we're missing an opportunity to treat them when the PSA is low and have a better chance of clinical control. We do know that, uh, that genomics, like the deciphered genomic classifier, provides independent prognostic information beyond the clinical pathologic features. So now, what's my approach as a urologist for my patients uh, after prostatectomy? If they're PT2R1 or PT3 disease, and they have a Gleason grade group of one to three at their prostatectomy, then what I do is I follow their PSAs. I still use ultrasensitive PSAs, but I follow their PSAs um, until it gets to 0.1, between 0.1 and 0.2, and then I refer to the radiation oncologist. You might say, well, why do you do ultrasensitive PSAs if you're not going to make an action decision for those patients until it gets to 0.1? It's because uh, I use it to decide my interval of PSA testing in those individuals. Um, what then I refer them to radiation oncologists. I might get uh, the genomic classifier decipher score to aid in decision making regarding energy deprivation therapy. I don't routinely restain these patients because it's unlikely that I'm going to detect any disease at a PSA between 0.1 and 0.2. How about for my patients with seminal vesicle involvement or higher stage or the ones that had high Gleason grade group um, of four to five at the time of uh, prostatectomy? For them, I follow their PSAs until it gets to greater than or equal to 0 .0, 0 0.02, and then I refer to the radiation oncologist. Here I use genomic classifier testing with a cipher to aid in decision-making regarding quote-unquote adjuvant therapy, but it's really more like early, early salvage, so that early salvage between 0 0.02 and 0 0.1. I do not routinely restage these patients because you, you know the PET scan is just not going to be informative in almost all of them when you're talking about PSAs between 0 0.02 and 0 0.1. So uh, I'm going to go over this part just briefly. There's an excellent talk that was given in this series by Dr. Sajdev um, earlier in the year. I, I really encourage any of you that missed that to, to see it. Um, but in these next few slides, I want to go over why do I do this approach? Why do I do what I do? So first, let's talk about the patients with the PT2, R1, or PT3A disease, Gleason grade group 1 to 3. So the guy with, with um, Gleason 4 plus 3 equals 7 prostate cancer who had extra prostatic extension and a negative or positive margin, say, a prostatectomy. Um, why do I wait till they get to PSAs of, of 0.1 or, point, uh, or 0.2? Well, there's three really well-conducted trials, radicals, raves, and the GATUG AFU-17 trial that show that early salvage radiation at PSAs uh, uh, at around 0.1 or 0.2 uh, compared to um, uh, adjuvant radiation, which was radiating them before that, really had no difference. So you're probably over-treating those men if you treat them when their PSA is completely undetectable. So are there any men that would benefit from radiation before 0.1? I said that radiation be, um, um, 
I do consider radiation below 0.1 in some men, and in those men are, are the guys that um, have higher Gleason grades or higher stage of prostatectomy. The three trials that I just showed you were really enriched for patients that had T2R1 or T3A disease and um, intermediate risk prostate cancer by Gleason intermediate grade prostate cancer. Um, the minority of the patients were ones that had higher stage, higher grade. What can we say about those patients? Well, this is a uh, um, retrospective multi-institutional study that Dr. Schaefer and myself were part of where we took men where we had their clinical uh, genomic feature, clinical features and their genomic features and long-term follow-up. And we said, what are the things that predict um, that the guy would benefit from radiation when their PSA was below 0.1? And there were four factors that came out. Um, they were higher stage T3B disease, obviously N1 disease, Gleason grade group, um, you know, four to five, um, and their deciphered genomic classifier. If they had just one of those risk factors, um, they really did not benefit, as you can see in the cumulative incidence curves on the left, um, from adjuvant radiation. But if they had more than one of those risk factors, then they did benefit from early, um, uh, we can call it early, early salvage, we can call it adjuvant radiation, but radiation before 0.1. And so that's why I get the genomic classifier in those men, and that's why I follow them and refer them to radiation oncology early. Just briefly, how about the question of should we add on androgen deprivation therapy with radiation in the salvage setting? Uh, it's an interesting question. This is a, you know, the RTOG 9601 trial looked at uh, people getting salvaged um, after prostatectomy um, with uh, um, radiation plus or minus two years of bicalutamide. And even though that trial showed an overall survival benefit, recently published um, subset analysis show that the overall survival benefit really was only happening in men greater than with PSAs greater than 1.5 nanograms per mil at the time of salvage. And so the question was, well, why wasn't it helping, you know, everybody? Well, it turned out that, you know, there was an other cause mortality increase in men with low PSAs, men that I was telling you you want to pull the trigger on early. Uh, adding ADT was causing an overall um, uh, other cause mortality increase. You could argue that, well, that's bicalutamide. No one's using a single agent bicalutamide. It's more morbid than ADT. The GATUG AFU-16 study, which is giving salvage radiation with six months of ADT, um, showed at 10 years an improved metastasis-free survival, but not overall survival. And again, it could have been because of some of the morbidities of ADT. So should nobody who's getting salvaged at low um, PSA levels get ADT? I, um, with their salvage, I think the answer to that is no. There is a subpopulation that um, that benefits from ADT with their salvage radiation, even when it's given at low PSAs, PSAs between 0.1 and um, 0.1 and 0.4, for instance. And those we can define those men perhaps using their genomics, which is why I was mentioning I get the decipher genomic classifier. Um, this is a subset analysis of the RTOG 9601 trial where they had about half the trial population, 350 patients, where they had uh, tissue to get decipher testing on. And what they showed is when they looked at people with lower PSAs, below 0.7 at the start of salvage radiation therapy, if your, your genomic classifier score was low risk, those men had minimal oncologic benefit from adding the androgen deprivation therapy, but they were harmed by the androgen deprivation therapy. They had uh, an overall survival detriment of about 8%. So 8% so more of them were going to be um, uh, dying earlier because they had the hormonal therapy. If you look at the people who had intermediate to high genomic classifier scores, you can see that uh, in that situation, if they added hormonal therapy at low PSAs, they had not only a, a distant metastasis free survival, a prostate cancer specific mortality uh, free survival benefit, but also an overall survival benefit. So again, you know, with a, uh, again, what I do is if my person has high grade, higher stage disease, um, I'm referring them to radiation early before the PSA even gets to point, point 0.1 if they have two of those risk factors. If they have lower, lower stage, um, lower stage intermediate grade disease, I'm referring them to radiation in the, what's the traditional salvage setting, point 0.1 to point 0.2, and I'm getting the genomic classifier to help my radiation oncologist and the patient and myself think about informed decisions about the addition of ADT. There's other trials that are ongoing in this area. They're also going to be analyzed with genomics, and we'll see if, how much this bears out. We've had a lot of discussion recently, and if, for some of you there on the last onco uh, oncology conference we just had, about PET imaging. And, you know, I was just telling you that, well, PET imaging is not very helpful when thinking about um, next steps after prostatectomy because 
it's not going to show disease in most patients with PSAs less than 0.2. So when should we get PET imaging? Um, well, I think that PET imaging, um, PSMA or Oxman, is really most useful in two settings post prostatectomy. One is uh, imaging men after complete local control. So ideally, you'd have a guy undergo radical prostatectomy, you'd be monitoring them carefully, and you'd give them the opportunity to get salvage radiation therapy um, when their PSA was under was under 0.4. Um, and now they've finished and they've had complete local control, in your opinion. But say their PSA is still rising. Um, now I'd want to get uh, I would want to get the PET scan to see if there's early detectable metastatic disease or even disease in the pelvis that may have been missed, and you can have therapeutic intensification there. I know that that data is still evolving. We have some phase two trials that show, show the benefits of stereotactic radiation to those lesions. The other setting is what if the person presents your office and they had not been followed carefully, they had not um, had this lecture and had this uh, bolded underlined statement by Dr. Ross that said, follow your patients carefully, refer them early to get definitive management, and they come and see you and their PSA is above 0.2 and they have not yet had salvage um, radiation therapy after prostatectomy. Here, I think the pet imaging is very helpful. It can help you with your treatment planning. We had recently reported results in the Empire One trial that was using fluciclovine that showed that failure-free survival was improved almost 30% by doing pet, uh, pet imaging and using it to help treatment planning in the salvage setting. This is an example of a, a patient uh, on the right um, who had a PSA of about 0.3 after prostatectomy had not had salvage radiation therapy. Um, he was imaged with, with PET scan. Uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but on the upper right-hand panel, there's a small, uh, there's some uptake in what looks like a lymph node. The, the original salvage radiation planning scheme was shown in the yellow on the bottom panel. This was modified to include that area in the, in the blue, which encompasses that um, positive area uh, on the lymph node. This obviously uptake, uh, you can see the uptake that's down here in the upper right panel uh, in the lower pelvis, that's just bladder uptake. Also importantly, when considering people who are getting salvaged, um, you know, they're coming to your office, they haven't had salvage radiation, their PSA is very high, say it's 1.52 even. For those patients, if they have extra pelvic disease, at least in retrospective series, they don't seem to benefit from salvage pelvic radiation therapy. So if you can see data outside the pelvis, you're not often gonna be helping them after prostatectomy by doing salvage in, in the pelvis. So now let's go on to talk about um, a more thorough discussion on, um, on workup and treatment of the post-radiation patients. So these are patients who have had, um, they, they've selecting between primary therapies, they selected to have brachytherapy or external beam radiation-based therapies, and now you're suspecting a, uh, um, a recurrence based on their PSA going to Nader plus two, or um, based on consecutive rises in their PSA. Again, you've been watching these patients carefully. You're initiating this workup when the PSA is hopefully less than four. Um, and then what are the goals here? The goals are you want to confirm the disease presence in the prostate um, after radiation. You want to confirm the absence of metastatic disease before you um, initiate some kind of salvage local therapy. You want to identify the location of the disease in the prostate because it's going to help you determine what treatment modality to use. And and around all this, you got to have a couple considerations. Imaging, I think, is very helpful, specifically MRI and PET imaging. But also, you have to note that MRI and PIRADS is not well validated in, in the post-radiation therapy setting. You can see that the first patient I presented um, uh, in, the, in the case contrasting cases today, um, the, the MRI showed a lesion. The radiologist uh, appropriately did not score it, but they did say, hey, that's a lesion you want to look at. And that was the area of positivity on his, on his biopsies, systematic and targeted. By the same token, the second patient really, we couldn't tell what was going on in the MRI. But they weren't really sure where disease was, and he had disease in every single core of the prostate and the seminal vesicles. PET imaging, very helpful. I use it primarily to tell me what's going on outside of the prostate. Do they have distant metastatic disease? Uptake in the prostate is not very well validated in the post-radiation therapy setting. You can see the second patient, again, had very little uptake in the prostate, lots of disease throughout their, throughout their prostate. And I think a lot of this might have to do with tracer uptake, blood flow kinetics, and other, and other issues. And so we'll get back to that in a second. So what's my, what's my approach then to the post-radiation therapy patient? So the patient has a Nader plus two or consecutive rises of the PSA. We're going to do some shared decision-making. These patients are often older. Older men often are 
are, are taken to radiation in the first place. So these patients often have limited life expectancy. So we'll calculate that and do some shared decision making before we proceed with workup. But then we'll proceed with workup and we'll do, um, uh, if they if they desire, and we'll do staging. A PET PSMA or FAT mucyclamine is preferred in this setting. You can do a bone scan or, or a CT MRI if the PET is denied, but I strongly believe that PET PSMA and fluciclamine are highly preferred in this in this setting. They have better performance characteristics. They're more sensitive and specific. They are closer to the real truth than quote unquote conventional imaging bone scan, CT and MRI. So then the second thing you want to do is no matter what that staging shows you, um, you know, I think it's useful to do a prostate biopsy, particularly if that staging does not show metastatic disease. If that if the PET scan does not show any uptake anywhere, you still want to do um, biopsy of the prostate because it can be misinforming you with a false negative in the prostate. When you do the prostate biopsy, you're going to sample the prostate, and additionally, you're going to sample the seminal vesicles. The seminal vesicles are often not treated by brachytherapy, often it's difficult to treat the tips of the seminal vesicles with external beam radiation. You want to sample all MRI um, questionable lesions. You want to sample all PET avid lesions. So then what happens then? So you've done your, your imaging and you've done your biopsy. What do you do next? So say the imaging demonstrates distant metastatic uh, disease. My general approach is they're not going to benefit from, from local salvage therapy. There are some question marks, but in general, they're not going to benefit from local salvage therapy. Say the pathology from the biopsy shows no cancer, or maybe it shows some malignant cells consistent with treatment effect. So, you know, and it's kind of a wishy-washy pathological thing. I don't really know what that means. Then I'll do no local therapy, and I'll clarify with my pathologist as to whether they mean that there's viable malignant cells in a background of cells that have treatment effect, or whether they mean that these look like ghost cells and they look like they were previous cancer cells that are non-viable. Um, the, uh, the pathologists in my group at Northwestern are excellent um, and they make it very clear on their reports. Um, but when I've worked in other practices, I didn't always have that degree of clarity. So it's an important thing to clarify with the pathologist what, what, what they're actually trying to tell you. I'm hoping eventually we'll be able to do um, in questionable cases uh, some you know, molecular analysis, maybe with something like a genomic classifier or a KI-67 or, or a uh, CCP score and see if these cells are proliferating or not in these questionable cases. But right now, that's that's not in their wheelhouse. So say there's vi viable localized disease detected um, by biopsy or, and there's no sign of metastatic disease. Here, I consider salvage cryoablation as a preferred option if there's no seminal vesicle involvement or periurethral disease, and I'll talk to you about why in a second. I consider salvage prostatectomy as a, as a preferred option if there is SVI or periurethral disease, um, or if it's really the patient's preference or the after a informed discussion. Honestly, I elevate this, this option a lot in younger men, like the second man I showed you. Uh, obviously, we're thinking about salvage prostatectomy because he had periurethral and seminal vesicle involvement but also he was only 60, <clears throat> 62. Other salvage options can be considered, and I'll talk about them briefly, salvage high foo and salvage brachy therapy. Uh, I'll, I'll make a disclosure that I don't have any operational knowledge, I only have book knowledge of these, of these therapies. I have not uh, done either of them in my practice. So just to reiterate some points, because we, we see these, thi these things happen, or I see these things happen a lot, I'm going to go over the workup and treatment of post-radiation therapy patients, and I just want to highlight some do's and don'ts. Again, um, I want to reiterate, do follow PSAs carefully and initiate workup when the PSA is relatively low, less than 4 nanograms per mil. We do not want to identify uh, missed opportunities for cure. Do perform staging to determine if metastatic disease is present. I, pref I prefer PET imaging. Do perform a prostate biopsy regardless of the imaging findings and do sample the seminal vesicles at the time of that prostate biopsy. Do not initiate ADT therapy for men with curable localized recurrences. The ADT therapy does not synergize to increase the effic efficacy of ablative therapies such as cryoablation, but rather can make those therapies difficult if not impossible to perform because often the benign tissue will respond to the ADT, but the malignant tissue won't. And now you're bringing that malignant tissue closer to the urethra. Giving ADT alone to men with curable localized recurrences is providing harm without benefit. So do not do that. Do not counsel patients that the treatment is worse than the cure in the salvage setting. Um, give them a balanced discussion. If you don't, if you're not aware of, of um, or do, if you don't perform salvage treatments, Make sure they see a provider that does those routinely because they need a balanced discussion. 
In fact, that discussion of telling them the treatment is worse than the cure in the salvage setting, that should be pervade to your initial discussion that we're having, particularly as urologists with patients, about surgery versus radiation. I think the old discussion of saying, well, do surgery first because you know you can't do anything after radiation, you can't do surgery after radiation, that's not really a whole truth. A better truth is to say, we're gonna pick between these two good primary therapies. You know, After surgery, radiation can be employed and it doesn't have that many side effects. After radiation, there are still salvage options. Um, yes, they will um, carry with them more morbidity than if they were used in the primary um, setting, but some of these salvage options, particularly um, salvage ablative options, can be relatively well tolerated. So let's go over these salvage options post radiation. You know, one thing that you know I found interesting in the, in the literature, and, and obviously there's lots and lots of caveats here, but cancer control rates um, are relatively similar in the uh, um, in the salvage in this in the salvage setting, despite what you use: salvage prostatectomy, salvage cryoablation, salvage high food, salvage brachy. This is a nice review by Dr. Nguyen's group. Um, where they looked at this, and the five-year recurrence-free survivals are all comparable, or you know, 50 to 55 percent-ish um, in their terms of their five-year biochemical-free survival. Lots of caveats because they're not adjusting for patient selection. There's no, there's been no head-to-head -head studies. But salvage prostatectomy is not necessarily the gold standard in well-selected patients. Um, there's this is a SEER Medicare review I'm showing here, and actually in this review. Now, uh, overall survival and prostate cancer-specific mortality favored salvage cryoablation over salvage uh, prostatectomy. And the Medicare expenditures for, sal for salvage prostatectomy were not surprisingly almost twofold higher than salvage cryoablation. How about functional outcomes? The salvage prostatectomy um, appears to potentially be the, the most morbid, with severe urinary incontinence uh, being between 30 and 90 percent. Um, I think uh, uh, in expert hands, reasonable point estimates to tell the patient is 30 to 50 percent. Um, erectile dysfunction is pervasive across modalities. The modalities that appear to have the best continence, uh, uh, continence control are salvage cryoblation and salvage brachytherapy. Again, numerous caveats. You can't really make head-to-head -head comparisons because there's a lot that goes into patient selection. It's just telling you that in appropriately selected patients, you can minimize urinary incontinence and other morbidities um, with still getting uh, good cancer control rates. It also tells you that whatever modality you're using, um, you know, the patient should expect that their cancer control rates are only going to be about 50% if you take all comers. But as I showed you earlier, if you're doing your workup appropriately and the PSA is less than four, the patient should be expecting about a 70% cancer control rate after, uh, with salvages after radiation. Another note is no matter what you do, a lot of these patients are coming in older, they're coming in with erectile dysfunction, a lot of these therapies are going to um, cause more dense erectile dysfunction. Um, I would say that um, particularly, you know, salvage cryoablation, at least in my hands, um, you know, I'm often treating outside the prostate towards the neurovascular bundles, and I will take them from you know, maybe mild to moderate, or maybe they start out with severe ED, but still eventually responsive on PD-5s, and I'll take them into what I can tell them is dense erectile dysfunction. Same thing is often true with salvage prostatectomy. Uh, as well, and the other salvage approaches. I'm going to talk a little bit about salvage cryoablation because, as I said, it's my preferred approach, at least when the when the when the patient um, is carefully selected and a good candidate for it. Um, just in basic concept, um, you know, what you're doing here is you have a, a you know a transrectal ultrasound guidance to watch ice ball formation. You're putting probes in perineally into the prostate, as demonstrated here, and you have a urethral warming catheter that's protecting the external sphincter. Uh, and the and the urethra during that salvage cryoablation. We do modern salvage cryoablation. Um, I would tell you a couple things. A, I'm treating the whole gland. Um, I do not think, and the cold registry does not think that you uh, data supports that you should not be doing partial gland salvage cryoablations. The reason is because a lot of these men were starting out with with uh, some degree of impotence and partial ablations did not preserve erectile func uh, function. All of them had bad erectile dysfunction after a salvage uh, cryoablation, whether you did partial or whole lands, so you're not doing the patients any favor. You're also not improving continence. Continence rates are excellent after salvage cryoablation, and it doesn't seem to be dependent really on whether you did a partial or whole gland salvage cry cryoablation. The, the, cry the rates of incontinence are like about zero to, to 5%. I would say it's about three to 5% is common. 
But you can, and, I, and, and the data says you do worsen oncological outcomes than uh, when you do that. And doing a redo, redo salvage, I think, is a very difficult cryoablation. So you want to get your best treatment as your first treatment in the salvage setting. Modern salvage cryoablation is, as I mentioned, trans transrectal ultrasound guided, so you can follow the ice ball. Modern salvage cryoablation is, is using a well-controlled uh, ice ball. That's by a, a gas expansion with argon as opposed to li liquid nitrogen. Um, in the machines that we use at Northwestern, the one that I prefer, the cryocare machine, uh, there's a slider that allows you to do variable ice ball lengths so you can sculpt and be away from the uh, external sphincter. You want to use thermal thermocouple mo monitoring during the procedure. I think the most important probe is the one that you put towards the urethra and external striated sphincter. You want to use a urethral warmer. That's a laminar flow urethral warming during the case. Uh, these are outpatient cases um, in the, you know, that take about an hour or so. Here's what the probe looks like. Um, the ice ball is always forming from the tip of the probe and then back. Um, the, uh, um, you're using argon uh, gas expansion to get to really cold temperatures, temperatures as cold as minus 140 degrees Celsius. And because it's the argon gas and using this Joule Thompson expansion effect, as soon as you turn off that gas, the ice ball stops growing, which is great. And a lot of the, this really prevents uh, treating areas you don't want to treat and having things like rectal fistulas or other injuries. This is the machine we're using. Again, it has those sliders that allow us to sculpt the ice ball. And this is an example. Um, you know, we're doing it as an outpatient setting under general or spinal. You can see the prostate there on the right under ultrasound. We're placing the probes uh, where they are, and then we're freezing the prostate, and the ice ball basically shows a black on the ultrasound. And that's how you can follow it. You can see at the um, bottom right, um, we're very far from the rectum there at the end freeze. Two freeze thaw cycles are used, and so the procedure takes about an hour because those freeze thaw cycles take that time. You need to get temperatures less than 40 degrees Celsius. Um, just like brachytherapy and other perineal procedures, it's hard to cover the whole prostate when it's greater than 50 cc's. Not usually a problem in the salvage setting, um, but just note that you know, you're trying to treat that. Um, procedure takes about an hour, minimal blood loss, obviously. Um, just note that we're using that, that um, urethral warming catheter, so we're intentionally protecting about a five millimeter radius around the urethra. So we're, you know, we're not treating disease in that area. Patient goes home the same day. If you give them a BNO at the end of the procedure, um, then they do not uh, need anything afterwards. They just go home with Tylenol as needed. The catheter should really ideally stay in 14 days. I've had some patients want to take it out early. And almost without fail, when they take it out early, they go into they have some retention issues. And the reason for that is there's not just a ablative killing at the time of the procedure, but a secondary inflammatory response that comes in, and it tends to peak around seven to ten days and then go away. And so these patients can be a setup for um, having retention after that, particularly in the salvage in the salvage setting. Uh, focal setting in primary is a different is a different story. So just in general, as we as we get towards wrapping up. What are the, so what are the different modalities? What are the positive and negatives? How do I go about treatment decisions? So salvage prostatectomy, some of the considerations. A big positive is it can treat periurethral disease. It can treat disease involving the seminal vesicles. It can allow for more staging by lymphadenopathy. Negatives is it's potentially the most morbid, having the highest rate of severe, um, of severe in incontinence. And having that being fairly common, you know, in, in I would say 30 to 50 percent of the patients, even in expert, even in expert hands. I think it's a good option for people who have periurethral disease involvement, like, um, and I think it's a good option for, for younger younger men. My um, In my practice, and again, I've only done about 40 of these salvage prostatectomies, um, but uh, um, most of the patients tend to be younger men, and my continence rates have been a little bit better, I think mostly because they've been younger men and carefully selected. Salvage cryoblation um, has low periprocedural morbidity, very good continence outcomes. I think, uh, you know, again, there's no comparative studies, but probably the best among the salvage therapies and continence outcomes, very cost effective. The negative is it can't treat periurethral disease through the warming catheter. It really, you, you're, you can't treat distal SV disease because you really are risking your renal injury with the ice ball growing into the ureters. You can't do a lymph node dissection. I would say still, if the patient um, appears to be a good candidate for this, disease is away from the urethra, non the SVs, it is my go-to. Um, you know, it is the thing that's going to have the lowest morbidity, equivalent cancer control with well-selected well -select, well patients. It is my go-to. Salvage HIFU has the advantage that it can treat periurethral disease, but also the disadvantages that it can cause periurethral sloughing. Uh, it has a higher stricture rate, um, uh, maybe, you know, one that approaches salvage prostatectomy, if not more. Um, it can have some issues in treating after brachytherapy. Um, 
with with uh, you needing to boost energy around the seeds. Uh, high food's only been FDA approved even as a modality to ablate prostate cancer tissue. Uh, so, you know, cryoablation has been FDA approved for actual treatment in the salvage setting. HIFU just for ablation of tissue. And a lot of us don't have a lot of experience with HIFU. So if I think if a salvage HIFU is going to be performed, really refer that person to, to an expert, uh, particularly if they had brachytherapy in the, in the past, in my opinion. Salvage brachytherapy has good continence outcomes, but again, you can't do lymphadenopathy just like the other ablative techniques. And it, there's more limited data um, on it, in my opinion. As a side note, um, you know, though salvage basic therapy after external beam radiation can be considered, I just want to make it clear, salvage external beam after breaking therapy, I think should be at best considered investigational only. And I would actually say it should not be performed due to unacceptable toxicity rates. There was only a small published series of this. And the um, in the small published series, I think there were unacceptable, very, very severe toxicities. I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not uh, trained in radiation oncology. I don't really understand dosing and when tissue gets what dosing, but I would not do external beam salvage after um, brachytherapy. But salvage brachytherapy after external beam can be done. And there is some questionability, maybe some clinical trials with some of the newer ways that we can give uh, radiation um, that's more pinpoint. Maybe there is some, um, some, some investigations to be done there. What's the peri and post-operative salvage follow-up? Um, you know, as I said, I mostly, and I, I only perform salvage cryoablation and salvage prostatectomy, so I'll just tell you what I do in those settings. Salvage cryoablation, catheter should stay in for two weeks and then come out. Salvage um, um, prostatectomy, I strongly think, and I've seen some of my colleagues, even experts, take out the catheter be before three weeks, like at two weeks, or as if they were, you know, or even earlier. Um, I have some experts that, you know, when I was down in, in, other, in practicing in other areas away from the Midwest, that would take take out a catheter just like it was a normal prostatectomy. I, I think that's a, a recipe for disaster. And I know that because there are patients would then follow up with me later. Um, you really want three weeks um, because healing is going to be retarded and it's going to just take a while and you're going to have to have good scar tissue laid down. And in that vein, do a cystogram prior to every removal in, in the salvage setting. If there's a question of a leak, even if contained, just leave the catheter in longer, let that seal up. Um, PSA follow-up, similar to after primary th treatment. PSA is Q3 months for one to two years, and then Q6 months for one to two years, and then yearly afterwards. For the ablative therapies, a NATO plus two definition is the commonly used definition uh, of biochemical recurrence, uh, and that's what we use after things like salvage uh, cryotherapy. It's a lot of content, but I hope it was, was helpful. And in summary, what I was, was going to say is that you know, recurrences and persistent disease after the initial attempt at cur curative therapy is, is they're, they're quite common. We're dealing with real disease now. Um, we're surveying the disease that really does not need treatment, and that's a good thing. But as we're dealing with real, you know, prostate cancers that need treatment, in a lot of other um, malignancies, we often need a multimodal approach to elicit cure. And the same thing is true for, you know, I think about half of the prostate cancers that we take to treatment. Uh, so it's not really a, um, you know, you shouldn't really think about it as a treatment uh, fail failure if your primary therapy doesn't work. The patient should be expecting that there's going to be some degree of treatment failure and need more therapy. And um, you should just see it as part of their care. Uh, so you, it should not give you any inertia to keep working them up and giving them more opportunities for cure. And that means vigilant um, and work up at early signs of re recurrence or persistence. A rule of thumb is if you haven't salvaged someone with a PSA, you know, less than 0.4 nanograms per mil um, after prostatectomy or less than four nanograms per mil after radiation therapy, you really want to take a good look at that patient, a good look at yourself and say, why, why have you not salvaged them? Is there a really strong reason? Because the best oncological outcomes are going to have are going to happen with those early salvages. Salvage therapies post-radiation have elevated risk compared to when they're performed as, as primary therapies. No question. Salvage prostatectomy has way more morbidity associated with it than primary prostatectomy. That's not really tr as true for salvage radiation after prostatectomy. I think that that's very well tolerated. Um, but even though salvage therapies like salvage prostatectomy, salvage cryoablation, salvage HIFU have had more morbidities when, they were, when they're performed up front, it doesn't mean we should deny those patients those therapies. In carefully selected patients, for example, salvage cryoablation is cost effective, provides excellent oncological control, good continence outcomes, and really has minimal perioperative risk. And what they're really looking at is you know, severe ED as their major problem, and and that and patients shouldn't uh, think that they should that they have no options, and then you're waiting till their PSA is over 10, and really they now you've made it so that they've had no options. Um, I'll stop. I'll stop there. Um, 
and take any and take any questions. Um, I appreciate your your uh, um, uh, your your attendance um, tonight. Uh, sorry, I'm in a hotel room. My daughter is uh, moving into her dorm today. I'm actually coming to you uh, from uh, sunny California, um, but uh, hopefully the reception was pretty good. And uh, um, and I'll take any questions in the last ten minutes. Hey, Ashley, hi, it's Ted Schaefer. Um, awesome talk. I actually have a question for um, the radiation oncologist. I saw a couple on the call still, I think. And I just wanted to get their comments about differences in salvage breaking between LDR and HDR, and if they could just expand on that a little bit, because my understanding of those differences if they're, uh, are, are very limited. So if anyone could just take over the mic, that would be great. And, and also for the radons to add on that, because uh, in my old group, we did have some people who were really expert in HDR. Add, a, add on like, you know, clinical expertise in HDR, what your thoughts are on that. If it is if it is better, like, you know, should we be doing it at Northwestern, that kind of thing. Please go ahead. I see Dr. Sashev, Dr. Hartz on the call. Yeah, I'm. Uh, this is John Calipurico. So I, you know, we've been doing uh, LDR brachytherapy now for probably 15 years. And um, they're pretty much, uh, it's six of one and half a dozen of the other. And uh, there is absolutely no difference. The only reason for not doing HDR is, you know, it's, it, it is it, when they are similar, you know, and you're used to doing one, you keep doing it, you know. So I, there is absolutely no difference um, in the effectiveness. The long-term data would be with, uh, LDR because of the Seattle group and their long-term Alvaro Martinez and those guys in Michigan and groups in California have certainly Syed and others have combined uh, HDR with radiation and uh, there is a, multi, a large randomized <laughs> trial uh, you know that uh, Mac Roach has done comparing these and uh, well personally I think there will not be any difference. Now, in terms in the recurrent setting, in the recurrent setting, I have never done brachytherapy because uh, I have I personally believe that the brachytherapy doses are very high uh, after radiation, and um, I'm extremely concerned about both the rectal toxicity as well as the uh, urethral toxicity. You know, so uh, their uh, NRG has done a trial showing feasibility in selected patients. I certainly am open to doing it, but uh, all the patients who've come to me, for my opinion, have uh, gone elsewhere for other treatments because obviously I would disclose fully that uh, this treatment is fraught with uh, toxicity that could be prohibitive in, with fistula formation and bleeding and retention and necrosis and so on. You know, so so uh, that's why I think personally, I don't have an experience with brachytherapy, even though there is a body of experience, I just feel that uh, the toxicity uh, may, may outweigh the benefits. The, uh, in my old group, Dr. Schaefer, and maybe I'll get some other uh, opinions, my, in my old group, they felt similar uh, to what Dr. Calpirico is saying that, you know, up front, LDR versus HDR, not much difference in the primary therapy for outcomes. In the salvage setting, there were a couple in my old group that thought that um, there, there was emerging evidence, at least, that HDR um, might allow for less of this toxicity. I I, I don't know. Um, I wonder if uh, if any other radonks have heard of this um, you know, themselves, but I don't know. But we had a couple um, providers that really um, felt that the way the radiation was given, you know, um, with you know really high dose and then off, um, somehow was, was if the if your catheters were per precisely precisely placed, would be would be sparing the the rectum and the urethra, but you know, it made me very, very worried. Um, Sean, do you have any any additional thoughts to what Dr. Calpirico said? You know, um, I would probably, you know, I don't do a lot of brachytherapy. The theoretical benefit with HDR is that you can control the dose distribution a little bit better. Um, I have friends and colleagues at other institutions who, you know, are, are very vocal with that with that kind of an opinion. Um, you know, as John mentioned, the RTG has shown that salvage LDR is feasible and largely safe and expert hands. So I think largely it, it, it probably matters more, you know, at the volume of the person who's doing this. You know, you definitely want to use some modern form of image guidance, which you can do with both. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know if there's enough data 
theoretically, HDR has some benefit in terms of being able able to more precisely control where the dose goes. But you know, there aren't a lot of crystal clear data that would say that one is vastly better than the other. Bill, Hi, um, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Is it okay if I make a comment here? Please, please. Um, this is a Tarak Batala. I'm a radiologist, diagnostic radiologist at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And we do have a, um, a couple of radiation oncologists in our group, uh, specifically doing brachytherapy, specifically LDR. And uh, we have seen a couple of cases where brachy was, salvage brachy was given for um, recurrence, both, both after post prostatectomy and also following prior combination radiotherapy. And how's how's it how's it how's it going? You said it, it's like so. I think uh, well one one question I'd ask is post prostatectomy. Why why would why would you want to do you know like brachytherapy over a traditional salvage external beam ther therapy? Uh, is there is there any good rationale? I mean, I think that the you know it's you know you know I I, mean, I know that the the disease down there sometimes is like is is severe. There's some people who have played with the idea of like of like intraoperative breaky even, but 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 why would you why would you want to pick that as a modality? Just educate us a little bit. Yes, I know these are the cases that I've seen at a tumor board. Um, I, I don't have any personal experience of having you know what is the decision process that how that was made. But my understanding is is based on the patient preference and also bulky disease at the fossa. Yeah, and so that that actually is interesting. You know, um, that's that's an interesting case. I mean, I, I I'm just a urologist, and I know that you know there's a patient that Dr. Cal Pierre and I treat, um, who and Dr. Vanderwell as well, who's a who has a bulky recurrence at the the fossa. He came into our group with I think some hematuria, the previous radical. Uh, and I, this is just me as a urologist and being a layman. I think that the, you know, um, Dr. Cal Pierpol is going to do IMRT on him. And I, I think that the, with the modern technology, you know, I, I, I don't know. I just think that we're, we're very good at getting dose where we want it now. And that, that's one of the reasons that I, that's sort of a, a favorite. I, I could see the rationale. And now that you're saying it, if they have really, really bulky, you know, centimeter size recurrences. Um, yes, yes. putting something in there that that makes that kind of makes sense and and it, I think it was MD Anderson or maybe it was the no the Mayo Clinic um, some of their IR doctors are are similarly doing stuff with cryo um, under image guidance they'll do like a, there's you know the one negative of the cryoablation machine that I use in the OR is that it's not MRI compatible the Galea machine uh, has MRI compatible probes and I think it's the Mayo or maybe it's MD Anderson that they're doing. It's um, Mayo. Um, it's Mayo. It's Mayo because we don't have a big of a cryo team here. Okay, But we perfect. do have so a MR guided, MR guided yeah, brachytherapy team. And specifically, we fuse them with the MR images. And that's the reason we were able to, even in the um, de novo LDR also, we try to avoid external sphincters and uh, bladder neck and try to be more precise in, in terms of uh, placing the seats. Yeah. You know, I well, think uh, I, I I I I agree that uh, I think Loyola also has a post prostatectomy brachy program, if I'm not mistaken. My concern, uh, Doctor Batala, is that you know, post prostatectomy, like you heard with all these cases, post prostatectomy radiation is very tricky. In as you saw with Bill Hartzell's case, you know. Now, with if you look at the PET scans and uh, PET staging, you you have to treat larger volumes to encompass the disease. And uh, I think, you know, just doing brachytherapy alone, if the patient has a one centimeter recurrence, you know, the concern would be that I'm missing all the lymph nodes, like Dr. Hartzell was showing with the perirectal nodes, right? So I think. You know, I agree you may give a biologically higher dose, but you can escalate with the external beam. And my bigger concern is, uh, you know, two things. One is encompass, uh, encompassing the lymph nodes that are at risk, because invariably the majority of patients that who have failed radiation in my practice have all failed outside the field, 99%. You know, and where are they failing? Distant bony mets and lymph nodes above, and I treat larger fields, it's, it's a periotic area. So those are those are areas that with brachy, 
And like uh, with smaller fields, you you fail even worse. And so my second concern with brachy post prostatectomy is that all you have is a bladder there. You know, the bladder and urethra will get a high dose. And uh, uh, as you know, the dose in the middle of the catheters is the highest. So you have to do some kind of a dose uh, finding expedition to find out the safe doses that can be delivered. And when you have so many, I mean, certainly I'm not brave enough to do that when there are so many alternatives that are very viable, I think, uh, but uh, others are obviously doing it and we look forward to their results. I agree. These I agree. are the sorry, sporadic sorry. cases and uh, atypical cases. Yeah. I have to say I appreciate you I appreciate you joining this this call. It's nice to have um, engagement from 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 other institutions. So I thank you for being here and for your comments. Very quickly, I know we're over time, but there's also this burgeoning, you know, there's a growing body of data looking at SPRT in the salvage, yeah, you know, recurrent, you know, intact prostate setting and very preliminary data, very limited follow up. But that is also something that people are interested in exploring more in the future. Yeah, I'm just the study that I was talking about that had like you may be familiar with it with the 11 patients. It wasn't it wasn't you know modern SRT, but it was uh, you know they had like 11 patients and two of them needed like exonerations you know because of um they you know they thought everything looked good and then the then the tissue just fell apart. You know one of there's a couple of things I would say. One is a ripe area of of research for radiation is actually not only an understanding molecularly which tissue which cancer tissue is going to respond well or not. But actually understanding which people are, which benign tissue, which people are going to be more prone, I don't know how you ever figure this out, who are going to be more prone to like severe, you know, um, toxicity or, you know, um, de or degradation of their, of their non-cancerous tissue. I think that that's, that's sort of a very ripe area. Um, I think that what, what, until we figure that out, I think one thing we have to, to say, or as these trials go on, like what you're talking about is, and I hope I showed, you know, we have really good treatment modalities that are just under implemented. And if you take cryo, which has been around forever, you know, it's been like one of the most misunderstood therapies, I think, you know, in my career. I think there was a period where the urethral warming, and it's because people did the wrong thing, maybe. The warming catheter was taken off the market, but people still did the cryos. And then guess what? There were a lot of urethral problems, you know, and then the word got out there that like, cryo causes urethral strictures and whatever. I haven't had one in my practice, not a single like urethral, urethral string stricture. Then, the, then there was like, I think cryo is easy. Learning curve is like zero. I think that like, um, you know, can, can fistulas occur with cryo? Certainly. It, do they occur in, if you're really vigilant and watching things? Um, I've never had one in my practice, not even close, I, you know, and, uh, um, but, the, but the word gets out there. And then, so then people kind of dismiss these technologies um, and they and they look for these other for these other things going on in expert hands condense rates zero to you know uh, in condense rates I would say I would say let's put let's let's not say zero let's say three to ten percent as a as a as a uh, aggressive estimate rectal fistula rates you really have to be in the zero point something percent if done by an expert provider um, and uh, and then and that is the benchmark that you're comparing like adding on EVRT or adding on another therapy or adding brachy on brachy. And I think you're really playing with, with fire um, with those. And I, I would discourage those trials until we understand, I don't even know what alpha beta means, but until we understand how much dose a particular person's tissue can take, you know, and maybe we'll take doing biopsies. Like I tell you, when I do salvage prostatectomies, I was telling Dr. Schaefer, and I had another case like this a couple of days ago, where if I do the biopsy and the, and the needle like, I can feel with a needle that like, you know, particularly with the perineal biopsies we do now, I can feel the scar tissue going in with the needle on some of my, uh, on some of my post radiation patients. And on some patients, I really don't feel that. And the patients where I can feel myself digging through the scar feeling tissue where the guy I operated on this week, the needle was actually deflecting off of his, uh, it could barely biopsy the prostate because it was deflecting on the scar tissue. Those guys and this guy in the operating room, his tissue was terrible. He really had a severe, severe, you know, a vascular reaction to the to the radiation, and there's other patients that don't have that at all. And I think we have to try to figure out that. I think that uh, um, I'm not sure how to do it. I think that maybe it's going to be clinical documentation and some molecular looking at. But I just, you know, as they go on to try these different salvage modalities of radiation on top of radiation, um, I think they have to be very careful that the benchmark of safety is, you know, what we what we what we showed in this talk at least of 
of um, of cryo and like and I, I would be very worried. Um, I'm just very worried. I think you know I'm 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 and I'm not I don't want to be too impassioned about it, but like I'm really worried. And even the first case I showed where they did breaky after breaky, I agree with John. I think that that they were playing with fire there. And also you know if you did it once and it didn't work, it, it must have been if you're excellent at what you do, it must have been because of technical you know limitations on the patient side. You know why why you know do it again? But anyways. I'll get off my soapbox with that, but um, but I would tell you, Sean, if you start one of those trials here, do what you always do and be very, very um, deliberate about it, and and uh, and you know, I I, you know, I would just have some caution. Although, as you said, SRT just like the HDR may be able to focus energy in a more precise way and avoid some of these problems. And but that's anyways, a concept, that's but I cannot agree with you more. Actually, you know, people have been throwing around, or uh, uh, you know, how to treat an, you know, intact prostate recurrence. You know, having perhaps a multi-stratified or multi-group approach through the NRG, and that's I think at the level of at, at which it should be done very carefully, with safety being the primary endpoint. Exactly. You know, and uh, but just one comment, I can tell you that I have treated now over the last 20 years, probably about 15 to 20 patients with re radiation after radiation. Mm -hmm. And we go to doses around 45 to 60 gray fractionated. And, um, you know, I have had no problems either with bladder toxicity or rectal toxicity. So what we did and your patient, Ashley, that we, we he will get the same thing. And I've treated probably six or seven patients where Given what I saw with this radiation, I saw that it was safe. And uh, with a couple of medical oncologists, we started augmenting the therapy with docetaxel weekly. And um, maybe sometime next year, early next year, I'll be happy to share the data uh, with you in our uh, discussion. And I think uh, we have treated, I have treated probably five or seven patients now mm -hmm. with doses ranging from 45 to 60 gray. If they could be post radiation, post brachy, post prostatectomy after uh, radiation, and we've had uh, tumor control in all of them, you know, with just 50 to 60 gray. And um, one patient, talk of safety, one patient, well, my patient had surgery, radiation, and recurred with the local recurrence of about, uh, and then I radiated him, had a local recurrence, and uh, we re radiated him. And uh, he, he had the severe ur urinary problems. We, we did uh, uh, hyperbaric oxygen, salvaged the urethra, then, went, then had a uh, stricture. And uh, in an attempt to relieve the stricture, he had an incision placed and he blew up with the fistula. You know, so, I mean, I completely agree, you know, that uh, vesico, femoral, urethral, the whole works, you know. So... Um, you know, I think one of the safety issues is after re-radiation, you never do surgery. Never. You can't even cut anywhere near. You have to do a suprapubic, you know. No perineal procedures will ever because you'll end up with a fistula. That is certainly one takeaway from my experience. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thanks for staying late. It just shows the interest in this discussion. I think the team here all knows, but we're trying at Northwestern to think about um, ways that we can do that we can flag providers that that a patient might be have um, might might have a, a recurrence early and need for the workup. I think that's the key to all of this. You know, early diagnosis and, and treatment. It's the key in the localized setting. It's the key in the recurrence setting. Thanks everyone again for staying and and having great a great talk. Day. Thanks, Ted. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you.